All right, what is up, guys? We're live for another episode of the Playing to Win series. Today, I have a guest who should require no introduction, but I shall introduce him as the most toxic, masculine male, the one, the only, Robert Frank. Let's go! Wow. <laughs> you do that, you, off with that one? You do that better than I can right now. I you didn't what, realize man? how much of that voice came from my gut. And now that I don't have guts anymore, um, it's it's hard to do that for long periods of time. But that was excellent. I, I you know, I got to tell you, it, it kind of hurts the neck and the throat a little bit. So I'm so I'm impressed that you're able to do it for that long. Yeah, no, it's uh, th like I said, all that that growl came from like the, the bottom of my gut. And then, you know, with what happened to me, which I'm sure we'll get into over the next hour or so, it's, it's not there anymore. I try to do uh, I, I, I try to uh, be inspiring and do some of those videos from time to time. But it just it's, it's not happening yet. But yeah, hopefully in a few months and probably 2022, we'll be back to normal. So let's get into some of that um, before we get started with the, um, you know, with the rise and the comeback sort of story. Um, I just want to kind of like tip my hat to what you've been doing. Cause I mean, like you're one of those guys out there that, that is able to point to facts and do it, do it in a comedic way where you kind of walk this fine line where you don't get banned from, you know, platforms cause it's kind of deemed as comedy. Um, you've been doing this for a while, right? Like how long did, how long ago did you create this character of Robert Frank 615 sitting in his car yelling and spitting all like Jack Tan juicy as hell, right? <laughs> well, the, um, I, I started making videos uh at the tail end of 2012 early 2013 um when vine was kind of phasing out and instagram videos just started but the the actual rage character that i did yeah um, the, the and i'm just gonna put it up but i'm not gonna play the audio just so we don't get yeah, any sure. issues because a lot of swearing in it but yeah no no worries no worries the um that guy started for maybe three or four videos on my YouTube channel in like 2015. I started doing it, but they were getting no traction at all. Like I would get a couple hundred views, a couple thousand views here and there. Um, and then the one video Pokemon Go, when that was the big craze and phase and everybody was doing that, um, that video was July of 2016, I believe. And that's when things just that video has got like a billion views on social media by now. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, Hey, maybe we have something here. So I started doing it more and more. And I evolved the character from just screaming to then I became like a rapper and, you know, I'm making my words rhyme, but still being motivating and inspiring. And I really didn't expect the character to be loved or to, to be something that people wanted to see. I wanted to be hated I wanted people to look at me and say, who the hell is this greased up guy yelling at me with a bandana? How old is he? Like, I wanted to be hated. And it turned out that people loved the character. Did you still get hate from people for any reasons? Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, I still get hate now, especially with what happened to me. They're like, what happened to you couldn't have happened to a better guy. I hope you die. You know, <laughs> we, get, we get those all the time. But when you put yourself out there and I'm sure you get it, too, because yeah. you're very, you know, you. You walk the controversial line, and even though you're telling the truth and everything you say, I'm sure you get your share of haters as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I call those my biggest fans. You know, they watch everything I do, but they hate on me. It's like, bitch, you're a fan. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. So, okay, so you created this stuff starting from Vine. Um, I didn't come across you until I was just, like, sit, kicking back watching a Joe Rogan episode, and he actually mentioned you in the episode, and he I think he put it up on the TV. Jamie threw it up on the screen behind him. I'm like, yeah. oh, this guy seems interesting. So I started to follow you on Instagram. Um, and it's been hilarious to like watch you take current events and just kind of like chop them up and like break them down for what they are. Um, so we won't spend too much time on that. You guys should go follow Robert on his social. Um, where's the best place for people to get those older videos? Is it mostly on Instagram is where they're all posted? um yeah i mean they're on my they, actually to be honest they're on every platform um okay. i i post everything everywhere for the most part and robert frank 615 is the name everywhere so you can yeah. easily find me how did you come up with robert frank 615 was that like a gamer handle or something from when you were a kid <laughs> no 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 i <laughs> i'm 43 years old man i stopped playing video games when i was like 12 but yeah um 
the name the name just came from that was what I picked when I first started an Instagram account and everything. And if I knew where it was gonna go, I would have picked a much cooler name. But mm. Robert Frank six one five kind of stuck, and now people know me by that. Cool, cool. And Robert Robert is my first name. Frank is my middle name, and six one five is my birthday, June fifteenth. So that's where all that comes in. Got it, got it. So um, I mean, like you had this meteor. Meteoric Rise, uh, you've got a, a, a supplement brand, brand you've got a, a clothing brand, you've got the Glorious Hounds of House of Gains podcast. Um, all of this kind of came to a grinding halt for you when you had a health issue a couple months ago. I, I don't know the exact date, so I'm wondering if maybe we can, you know, spend some time around that. But I mean, what what was it that created the health issue? Do they ever get to the bottom of it? I mean, I'm sure a lot of your haters are just going to come at you with, oh, it's all because of all the steroids and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah, of course. Um, no, like you said, everything was clicking on all cylinders. Everything was going great. My merch was moving the supplements. I don't own steel supplements that's owned by someone else, but I'm one of their top people. I guess you could say mm -hmm. a lot of people think I own the company, but I really don't. Um, everything was, was clicking podcast was going great. And then, uh, tail end of February of this year, just a couple months ago, I started crapping blood. And, you know, when when you live the lifestyle that I live and although I'm not a competitive bodybuilder, I live the bodybuilding lifestyle. I do the supplements. I do the super supplements. I'm not ashamed to say it. And throughout the years, I've crap blood before, but it usually went away after about a week. This mm -hmm. was not going away and it was getting worse and worse and worse. And it, it turned out where I was making like 30 to 40 bowel movements a day of just straight blood. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a dude, I'm a guy. I'm like, it's going to go away. I ain't going to a doctor. I got this, man. Yeah, I got this, <laughs> Just drink man. some more water, man. I, exactly. I got this. Exactly. So yeah. um, it got to the point where it was so bad where, I mean, I couldn't walk. My lower back, like everything was shutting down on me. And my wife rushed me to the ER. They did all the tests. They diagnosed me with uh, ulcerative colitis. That was on March 11th. Um, and I was in the hospital being treated aggressively, uh, with all the steroids, not the good kind, but the kind that mm -hmm. they give you in the hospital and IVs. I had four ports in each arm of them just shoveling all, all this medicine in me. Um, and I was in the hospital for about a week and a half. And then my colon perforated kind of like when your appendix burst, mm -hmm. my colon burst. And I needed emergency surgery on March 24th. They removed four and a half feet of my large intestines. Um, and after that surgery, everything went downhill. My kidneys were failing. My lungs were failing. My heart was failing. My liver was failing. Every specialist in the hospital were like, I was their number one patient. Uh, it came to the point where the, the, um, what do you call the, the religious guy that comes into the hospital? Oh, the the, priest. Uh, yeah, the priest. Like um, reading your last rites sort of thing. Yeah, he would come in and visit me. And I'm like, listen, do you know something I don't? Because I really don't want to talk to you right now. I'm mm -hmm. not really that religious of a person. But um, yeah, so it was really scary. And then things started to turn around. And then on April 1st, my colon perforated again. They left a little piece of colon. They left like 10 inches of my colon. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I could get because I, I have a bag, a colostomy bag on my stomach now where I take a poop. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, hopefully I could get this reversed uh, in a couple months. But they let they had to leave a certain amount of colon in order for that reversal to be successful. Mm -hmm. So um, with that little piece that was still there on April 1st, just a couple weeks after my first or a week, actually, after my first surgery, that piece burst again. So I was in all kind of bad shape. I was in the hospital for two months. So, um, how much of that came, like, was a product or a, or like, was, was gear a catalyst to any of that? Cause I know that, um, they've done a lot of studies on steroids and I've been on, on TRT since I was 43. So I don't mind talking about it. Um, I mean, I've been out of Mexico where everything you get over the counter is like, you, you don't need a prescription for shit. So it's like, I'm gonna have some DECA. I'm gonna have some of that. I'm gonna have some of that. And you just kind of pile it all together. Right. You know, you have a good time with it, you know, while you're down there. But, um, there's a lot of studies that that show like that, you know, prolonged use of, um, you know, higher dosages of gear will create problems for certain organs, more specifically stuff around kidneys and like urination and uh, prostates and all that. But I've never heard of anybody having like colon failure because of uh, testosterone and other gear. Right. So can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, do you have any insight since? 
Yeah, I mean, they they tested me. The, the way that you get what I get is two ways. It's either bacteria or it's autoimmune. They mm. tested me for the 9 million different types of bacteria that it could have been from food or just whatever I ingested or put in my body. They ruled that out 100%. They said you have the autoimmune version of um, ulcerative colitis. And they're still not 100% convinced that ulcerative colitis is going to be the final diagnosis. There's still a possibility that I have Crohn's disease, which is like a sister disease to ulcerative colitis. Um, and if I do have Crohn's, then this bag that's on my stomach right now is going to be with me forever. And that's going to be horrible. So I'm praying that it's uh, that it's ulcerative colitis. Um, but they said it was going to come out no matter what. It had nothing to do with, with the gear, nothing to do with the supplements, nothing to do with the food I was eating. It was just it was always going to happen. And it just picked its time and came out. And I, I've noticed I, I've talked about this in other, other interviews. I've noticed my stomach changing over probably the last three years where I loved hot food. I loved buffalo wings. I loved all this, all that. My stomach wasn't having it anymore. Within five, 10 minutes of me having anything spicy or, or hot, um, I was in the bathroom and I was like, whoa, this is weird. <laughs> yeah. And it didn't look like from any of the pictures that I saw that you've posted, um, you know, on social that you had anything that would have like, you know, distended your abdomen or had like fatty liver disease or anything. Cause you're still pretty like trim in your waist area. Right. Uh, well, yeah, I was. Um, but what happened when I went, yeah. So before I went to the hospital, everything was good. There were no problems. Um, but when I got out of the hospital, I went in, I went into the hospital at 209 pounds, I came out of the hospital at 138 pounds. Wow. So I lost. Uh, how uh, uh, tall are you? Um, five, uh, five, nine and a half, five, ten. That's that's a ton of weight, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And but, you could. And that was all muscle mass, too, I bet. Right. Oh, every, everything gone. And I that mean, just goes to show you what like, you know, elevated levels of cortisol and stress will do to your body. Like it just eats your fucking muscle mass so quickly. Yeah. hundred percent. That that's every, every bit of muscle. I even asked the surgeon. Uh, I was like, why is it that every ounce of muscle that I ever put on my body just disappeared? And she gave me some, you know, uh, professional explanation for it. And it made sense at the time. I couldn't even regurgitate it, but, um, you know, yeah. And so that being so light and, and frail, um, and I posted videos of, and pictures of, you know, how I looked when I got out of the hospital and the, the, the way that my brain worked, I just wanted to put on the weight as soon as possible. So I was in every drive through. I was in Wendy's. I was in Sonic, McDonald's, just eating ice cream and burgers and anything to put on the weight. And I have gained 25 of those pounds back. I'm in like the low 160s right now. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not good weight. <laughs> it's it's no. all my stomach and my I got a I got belly fat that's hanging over my belt line right now. It's horrible. But we'll get back. Why are you? eating that stuff though like why aren't you going more you know like you know leafy greens and like organic grass-fed meat and stuff like that like why do the drive-through you know process shit because i knew that was going to be the easiest way to put on a lot of weight as soon as possible and i really didn't care where it went or how it looked but the one thing with having this this bag um on my stomach you have to stay away from uh roughage and stuff so i can't eat salads or any kind of spinach or lettuce or anything like that because it backs up the uh the ileostomy that i have wow so that's a big change in your lifestyle eh? oh yeah because i mean i was i was eat i was i was a bro i was eating yeah. grilled chicken and and broccoli and sweet potatoes and you know all this good healthy food um and now you know i just didn't have the appetite for it i was like i don't want grilled chicken and broccoli i want a hamburger and french fries let's get this weight back on yeah um Okay. So, I mean, we talked a bit about, you know, where you came from and what all happened, but with this series, I like talking a lot around the notion of playing to win versus playing not to lose. And I know a lot of guys that have watched the prior episodes and followed me for a while know what this is, but, um, I mean, like we're talking about something that might've retired most guys and, you know, here I'm looking at a guy, like you did this kind of like a prequel to it looks like it's almost like a documentary that you're filming you know for your comeback on your channel i made a comment and i shot you a dm on twitter to try to connect and do this cast but um you know a lot of guys would just basically quit you know retire and say fuck you know like, i know what it's like when somebody cuts your you know cuts in your stomach because i had a, a cut about that big you know made to get my um 
appendix out when I had appendicitis. And it was like about a week of like, like I saw this look on your face when you were posing in the mirror and like you had tears in your eyes, yeah, you know, sort of thing. Cause you hated looking like that. And I know that feeling cause it's like hard to stand up. It's hard to take a shit. It's hard to walk around the block, you know, to kind of stretch your legs. And it takes a while for you to get that back. Like you don't realize how invasive that is. But I mean, you had basically right down like the center of your stomach cut open. Plus you got the side cut open. Did they have to cut you through the back as well? I mean, no, yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing in the back, but I'll show you. I don't know if you guys can see that scar that's yeah. going all the way down. It's about six inches. And there you can see my, my little Poop bag egg. that I got where I, where I drop a deuce. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it, it was, it was horrible. I mean, I still, I'll be honest with you, Rich. I don't even think I've actually absorbed or digested or come to the realization that this happened to me yet. Cause I still have moments of weakness every day where tears and maybe it's because I'm not on TRT anymore. Cause I don't want to do anything to mess up this next surgery that I have scheduled for September 16th. Um, I'm not on any TRT. My estrogen levels are probably through the roof. I could watch people shaking hands on TV and tears come to my eyes. Mm. Um, and it's just, it, it's rough, man. Cause I go back and you know, you're, you're, you, you swipe through your camera roll on your phone and you're looking at all these pictures when you were great and everything was going good, clicking on all cylinders, you were jacked. And now I'm like, man, this, this, this is brutal, but Hey, people, the, the reason why I am so motivated and, and, and driven to get back is because I know I, I have a very big audience of people that is looking forward to this comeback and it's inspiring them. So how can I let them down? You know what I mean? I, I got to do it. What do you think of this concept of, um, you know, bigorexia? I came across it in my twenties when I was, you know, reading a lot of the Jim Bro magazines and all that sort of stuff. And it was like a condition they were trying to describe where you can never be big enough or, you know, you look in the mirror and you never see like enough of a man and you have to go back to the gym or eat more calories or have your next meal and all that sort of thing. Do you think that's a real thing? Oh, hundred percent. One hundred percent. I, I, last night, for example, I was on the treadmill doing some cardio, uh, post-workout and I'm showing my manager um, pictures of me. And I was like, Joe, I thought I looked like crap here, but I look so good. He was like, yeah, it's all in your brain, bro. It's like you're, you're never. And he was like, when you get back to that point where you're shredded again, you got veins coming out of everywhere and your shoulders are, are back to being wide and your back is wide and you got the thin waist and everything, you're still going to think you look like crap. So he's like, just, you know, it, it appreciate this, this journey. And no, big, big orexia is 1 million percent a thing. How did all this change you? Like, what's been the biggest change in your life since all this happened? I mean, you've probably had a lot of time, you know, during the recovery, lying in bed with tubes and you know, all that stuff like. Uh, the biggest, uh, the biggest change, um, I guess, other than physical appearance, um, just, I don't know, man, I. I've never dealt with any kind of anxiety or depression or anything like that ever in my life. I, I was always a person that thought that type of stuff didn't exist. I thought it was a switch that people could turn on and off. Oh, you're sad. You're depressed. Blah, 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 blah. Go to the gym, lift some weights. You'll feel better. I, I, I never thought it was a real thing until this happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, and now, like I said, I go through moments of, damn, this, this really sucks. And, um, yeah, I go through some some dark thoughts go through my head that I never thought in a million years would ever enter my brain. That's probably the biggest change is like my mental state has crumbled, but we're trying to rebuild that other than my physical. But everything else is is going well. The podcast is going well. The merch is yeah. moving like crazy. And um, and I'm not as strong as I used to be. I, I'm lifting 10 pounds on each side of uh, of the hammer strength of chest press now where I was able to load it up with all the 45s that they had in the gym. So that's mm -hmm. the biggest. It's crazy, man. Um, sorry, I got my cleaning lady walking in the front door. I'm just got a little distracted there. I got to make sure she doesn't come in here while we're doing this. Um, okay. So getting back to the whole, um, you know, going through the recovery and like the uh, comeback, like what's the strategy for you with the comeback? Um, well, I mean, right. <laughs> basically my comeback is in the hands of the surgeons that are going to be putting me back together and their instructions of what I can and can't do. Um, I did get the green light on June 1st to start going back to the gym. So what are we at the 24th, 25th now? Yeah. 24th. So, yeah. I can, I've been back in the gym for about three weeks now. 
uh, lifting lightly. I'm starting, as we talked before, I was eating crap and now I'm starting to clean up my diet. Um, and it's just be as healthy as possible for this next surgery, uh, for a better chance of it being successful, because there is a chance that it could go wrong as with any surgery. Yeah. Um, and it's just be, be healthy, be as healthy as possible and, and get back into my routine of going to the gym and doing cardio and just, you know, I'm documenting everything, all the ups and downs of, of what I go through over the next couple of months, um, is going to be on film. So you had this, um, you know, this, uh, uh, moment where you kind of mentioned like these, you know, uh, you know, weaker guys. And I've seen you met, you know, mentioned in, in videos, it's like, just go to the gym, man. Like just stop, stop complaining about stuff. Don't be a wimp. Just go and lift, bro. And a lot of guys laugh at that. And they sometimes mock you when you say that. And yeah, I've, gotten into this pattern lately where I get messages from it's usually younger guys like in their teens or maybe early early 20s and they're like hey man you know I like everything you do and I want to be mentored by you you know what do I need to do like I'll make your coffee I'll wipe your ass you know whatever it is you know it's going to take and I always start with you know what show me that you can do 30 push-ups 10 chin-ups and skip rope for three minutes straight start with that and almost always these guys can't do basic stuff, you know, like fundamental basics that would improve your uh, confidence and your positivity and your outlook in life and get all like the endocrine markers firing up and making you feel better and all that. Like, like I'm big on that. And I think it's really important that if you want to be successful and you want to get something done in the world, like you've got to have a, a competent body and mindset to do that in. What are your thoughts on how, lifting and working out and, and not necessarily being like a full-on hardcore gym bro right but do you think that that played a big part in your success as a guy oh yeah because i mean anytime you would see me do those videos uh in the car that you know the more popular ones that where i'm in the car screaming is either right before i'm going into the gym and i'm just doped up on all this pre-workout or <laughs> or it's post-workout and i just got done with the workout and I mean, anybody who's gone to the gym and, and actually put in the effort to, to do a workout, you don't have to be big, you don't have to be jacked, but you people know when they, they've had a good workout, you feel different. Like you feel super confident, you feel inspired, you feel like you could take on the world just because of, like you said, all the endorphins and everything running through your body. Um, that was a big part of the character um, is, is being in the gym or around the gym. Obviously, you know, I was all jacked up and everything, but yeah, that that definitely helped my my mental state to create content and whatever came to my mind, I would just spit out and it was always surrounded around the gym. And the earlier videos, especially every video was whatever is going wrong in your life, whatever is happening, whether it's a challenge on TikTok or Instagram or whether it's this or whether it's that screw all that, go to the gym, screw all that, go to the gym and and people dug it. Did you have to script those um episodes that you did or are you just kind of like all right you know here's a topic i'm just gonna dive into and just yell yeah i mean as i'm driving it's funny as i'm driving around a line will come to mind um like the, the t-shirt that's behind me when you're jacked and juicy the hose get loosey like something goofy like that will come yeah. to my mind and i'll throw it in my notepad um and i'll be like i gotta fit this in a video somewhere but the very first videos where i'm just screaming and ranting there was a, a, a topic came to mind Let's just go and do it. But as the character evolved and, you know, I can't just scream and and people hold people's attention. I always had to kind of um, change it up a little bit. And then I would start to not script them, but have certain lines that I knew I wanted to fit into the video. And um, and yeah, and I would just make sure that they got in there no matter what the topic was. Is this something that you saw yourself doing when you were younger? Like, um, <laughs> oh. what did you want to be when you were growing up? Like, what was your life plan for winning? I'll be honest with you, dude. I don't, I don't even know. Um, I, my, the way I was raised was when you get done with high school, you got three choices. You go to the military, you go to college or you go to work. I pick go to work. So mm -hmm. I got a, you know, back then I, I got a, a warehouse job. I was a teamster, uh, worked for the local 863 teamsters union from the time I graduated high school until we all got laid off 15 years later. Um, so that was a big portion of my life. And, the money that I was making just getting out of high school and working in a, a factory, basically, 
um, was more money than my friends that went to college were making. So I was like, I ain't doing the college thing. But then eventually over time I, I went and I got some college credits because I thought I needed that. Um, but no, I never saw myself actually having any type of profession. I got into personal training. I was certified with three or four different personal training uh, organizations. And I knew I wanted fitness to be something in my life, but I never thought that would be my full-time gig. And I never in a million years would have thought screaming in my car would be my full-time job. But as of uh, February 1st, 2017 is when I resigned from what I was doing. And I've been doing this ever since. So it's over four years now. Yeah, this is pretty new for you then. Um, what do you say to younger guys that are looking for their purpose, looking for something to do in their life? Like what advice do you give those guys? Um, I mean, really, w whatever I say, just give it your all. I mean, I know that's cliche and corny, but whatever it is that you want to do, whether you want to work at McDonald's, be the best damn hamburger flipper you could be, you know what I mean? Or just inspire to be uh, the best at whatever it is that you do. and. Mm. My goal was to be the best car screamer and uh, it worked out for me so far. And it was um, like, there's a difference between a talent and a gift. Like a talent would be, okay, you're the best damn hamburger flipper at, you know, the burger shack sort of thing. Um, that could potentially be a talent, but a gift would be basically the guy in the Jag screaming blindfolded at the camera on a topic. But so many guys struggle to like, I would say that you probably had that frying pan of the forehead moment. That's what I just call it. I mean, like everybody's got a name for it, but it's like a whack, you know, the forehead. It's like, this is so obvious to me. This looks like this is what I need to be doing. And I have fun doing it. And <clears throat> that's what you figured out after the whole Pokemon one, right? Like that was the frying pan of the forehead moment for you. Uh, yeah. Um, well, it, it wasn't really, even though the Pokemon one was the one that got the ball rolling, um, as I started to do them and they started th th those types of videos started to pick up traction. It was like, all right, that's when I was like, okay, we got something after the Pokemon video. You know, there's so many on social media, there's so many one hit wonders, you know, you mm -hmm. see people, you know, they have their, uh, what's that Corey Hart song sunglasses at night was yeah, his one hit wonder. Yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't want the Pokemon go video to be my, I wear my sunglasses at night. I was like, let's see if, if people are digging this. And uh, it was probably after maybe my third or fourth one of those types of videos uh, that I was like, it hit me. I was like, damn, we could we could kind of make a living doing this. How many um, how many videos did you um, do before you had that like knock it out of the park Pokemon issue? I mean, videos in general, hundreds um, doing that guy playing that character, um, maybe four or five. So but again, I didn't really do I didn't do them because they weren't doing well so i just i i kind of stopped and then that pokemon go phase came and that just hit it hit a home run for me yeah i always tell guys you know in the absence of clarity like just start doing something so you did over a hundred videos or a hundred attempts at um getting some traction going viral um and it took all of those until you had that pokemon hit that really made sense for you yeah. I mean, I, I tell the story all the time that me and my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, we would, when we first started out on social media in 2013, 2014, 2015, trying to, you know, you're always, you always want to go viral. And we would spend, I would have ideas in my head to do some type of video and we would drive, we would spend all weekend, hours and hours and hours filming, editing, doing this. And the videos would get 40 views, mm -hmm. 100 views if I was lucky. Um, so I just, I stuck with it and uh, I guess that's the big takeaway is just be consistent and don't take no for an answer. One, one day, something you do is, is going to pick up a lot of steam. And, uh, I don't know if you brought it up before we went live, but my, my, my mission statement was comedy controversy TNA. I, in one of, in my videos, I had to have either all three of those things or one of those things. And nowadays it's so hard to do the controversy thing because all the platforms they shadow ban and they pull your videos they kick you off the platform i lost a two hundred and fifty thousand uh follower instagram account early in the year because i was doing my political bs um they didn't like what i was saying they ripped me down um 
you know, I've, I've lost, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a different world now. It's, I wish we were back in 2014 where you could say and do anything. And people were like, haha, it's satire. It's funny. Now it's, you're uh, being offensive. You're bullying, you're harassing mm. and it, it's horrible. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just scrolling back here, you know, through the feed and there's a lot, of, I mean, you've even had attempts here where you had your, uh, she was probably a girlfriend at the time, you know, try to do like the imitation of you blindfolded, you know, yeah. in the car. Um, there's lots lots and lots of uploads here, even ones with very low engagement. Well, you know, very low compared to what you got today, but like, you know, a few hundred, um, you know, engagements like likes and a few, like 10 comments and stuff like that. Yeah. You've been at this for a while. Like this is not something that's, um, you know, like an overnight wonder. Like a lot of people think like when you do something, oh, you just got lucky, bro. Or it's just like, you know, you had that, you know, the right place at the right time. And that's why you got to where you got, but people don't understand most overnight successes take years and like you just talked about, I mean, it took a hundred plus attempts to even get anywhere close to um, getting something that knocked it out of the park. Um, yeah. Hey, question for you with your um, wife, because this is something that comes up a lot. And I mean, like you put yourself out there, so you get risk exposure. Um, there's of course haters. Like I get haters from all angles, dude. Like I get haters from uh, feminists, from lately even the gay community, you know, apparently. Um, you know, these uh, doom and gloom guys. And, you know, from time to time, they're all, yo, Rich, you know, show me your your receipts. You know, where's your girls? This and that. It's like, I'm not going to dox my check. I mean, a third of them are going to rub one out to him. A third of them are are basically going to say something like, ah, oh, you know, her eyebrows are, you know, distorted or something like that. And a third of them are going to be like, dude, you don't even need to do this. Nobody cares. Like, we already trust who you are sort of thing. But I mean, like, from the get-go, you've already... on your toxic news show, too? Uh, you cut out for a minute. What about the toxic news show? The, the um, uh, toxic, I, I can't remember what the meathead, show. meathead minutes. Me, yeah, that's it. Meathead minutes. And I think yeah. you got your wife in there too, you know, doing like the weather. Yeah. Her, okay. her so, fake weather update. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you get from guys out there when you got your girl out in your audience, you know, doing your thing? Like, is that a, uh, thing that pops up over and over again you're like look you know we got to manage this because there's because there's some real pricks out there like how does that work for you well in in the very beginning of of doing the video she was in a lot of them um and she was my tna part of the video where yeah. you know um have her in a bikini have her in booty shorts have her in leggings you know stuff like it that kind of yeah it, yeah it excels um but then she actually got a real job and we kind of had to taper back her being in videos and stuff. So yeah, she does like the weather update or she'll do a traffic update in those meathead minute sketches that I do. But, um, I try to keep her out of as many videos as I can. And, um, but people recognize her when she goes out, she'll go out with her girlfriends. People are like, aren't you Robert Frank's wife? But luckily, thank God with her anyway, there's never been any type of negative altercation or anything like that. She's always been left alone. That's good. Um, what else we got to cover here? I got a bunch of stuff here. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, and there's so much to, to talk about. What, are, what are the big plans for you now? Like after this operation, like, is this, is this back to Robert Frank, six, one, five screaming in the car? Like, do you think that you can get back to that guy? I, I hope so. I mean, you, you always got to go back to what took you to the dance, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I do want it. Those videos are, are fun to do. Um, and I want to get back there, but like I was saying, I can't right now just because I can't growl like I used to. It just, it, it mm -hmm. doesn't sound the same and I can't do it for the length of time that I did, but that is the goal to get back there. And I knew I couldn't just do that guy. I have to do other things. So that's why I started the meathead minute segment. So, you know, now we have like a little news show, a satire news show. Um, you know, all the other goofy things that I do on TikTok now, because that's the, the platform that the kids are using these days. And mm -hmm. I always tell people, um, that want to do social media full time. Like my job is social media. I make videos and create content for a living. <clears throat> I always tell people who want to do what I do is be everywhere. Don't just rely because look at all those vine kids back in the day that yeah. had, 50 million followers on vine. And then one day vine went to shit and um, you know, they had to rebuild themselves. So I tell people, if you want to do, if, if social media is what you want to do and you want to stick your big toe um, in the social media game, be on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, like be everywhere. So that's my advice. I know that was four or five 
questions ago, but yeah, that's mm. another piece of advice I would give people for doing what I do and, and what you do should be everywhere. What's the story behind the um, beard? Because I mean, back in the early days, you didn't even sport a beard. This is something that's relatively new. <sighs> well, the beard story um, started um, from twenty from 2011, 2011 to 2017, before I resigned, I sold insurance for a living. Mm -hmm. I did uh, over over the phone Medicare sales. I was very good at it too, um, making cold calls all day. And one of the rules in the office was you couldn't have a beard. You had to be clean shaven. You could do a mustache and that was it. They were mm -hmm. very strict on facial hair. And the minute I resigned, I was like, I'm growing a beard. And this has been this has been growing for four years. And this is I mean, I get it trimmed up, obviously, but mm. I wish it was down to here somewhere. But my facial hair just stopped growing. Got it. It was more like a like a like a not a slap in the face, but I forget. It, it was almost like the baseball player, Johnny Damon. He was on the uh, because the Yankees wouldn't let people uh, grow their hair out and, and have beards. When he was on the Boston Red Sox, he grew out his long Jesus hair and he had this big beard. So it's kind of like a slap in the face too. yeah it's like a big f you yeah. who do you take um who do you take your inspiration from or who have you taken your inspiration from you know in the past um there, i mean there's so many people that i can i can credit to inspiring me to do what i do um and it's it's weird because some of them like have nothing to do actually all of them have nothing to do with the fitness industry um i don't know if anybody's familiar with yusuf erikat he he went by fussy tube uh, he was like a prankster comedy yeah. type dude on uh, yeah. on YouTube. Um, well, I I got a, a lot of inspiration from from him, um, and also, oh man, uh, Emery King. Um, he actually Emery King. I didn't know him from Adam when that Pokemon Go video went viral. He commented on it, and I saw a blue check mark commenting on my video, and I, and he was trolling me. He was like making fun of me, like oh steroid guy, blah blah blah, and I was so mesmerized that someone with a verification check mark on facebook actually reached out to me that i private messaged him and i said hey i know you're making fun of me i know you don't like the video but i think it's really cool that you commented on my video and he was like what's your number and i was like well, what so i gave him my number and he called me and he told me he sat there for 20 minutes and told me keep doing what you're doing keep doing what you're doing you, you got something here and uh, I just talked to him yesterday. I don't know how many people are familiar with Emory King, but um, yeah, those those two people in particular are are big inspirations for me. What about the business side of things? Like, who do you take inspiration from? Like, who do you look to for advice or guidance? <sighs> On the business side, I really don't. Uh, I because I mean, know. you are a business, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You know, like uh, Jay Z would have said, like, I'm a businessman. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know if I take inspiration from anyone. I have a team that that I surround myself with that uh, is smart people. I'm just I'm just the video guy. I'm just the guy that screams in the car. But I surround myself with people that know about investing, know about money, know about this, know about that. We just signed on with a management team in December that they manage the Hodge twins. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they manage uh, Don Trump Jr., uh, Mike Tyson. So I got my foot in the door with them, and they've been very helpful of, of making the brand grow bigger on the business side. Um, and yeah, but no one, no one that I think you would actually know come to mind in terms of who do I want to model myself after. What's um, If you go back in a time machine and have a conversation with yourself at 20, assuming that you would listen then, right? What would you be telling yourself? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, probably at that time, I'd be like, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it for the next 13 years or so because things are things are about to turn up. Uh, if if I had a crystal ball, um, but I don't know because I've always been, I've never been a lazy person. I've always either had a very good job or two jobs to to make money. So even in, at 20 years old, I, I was never, you know drinking on the weekends, doing drugs, whatever kids do these days, getting into trouble. I was always working. Mm -hmm. um, so if anything, I would have told my myself, listen, pump the brakes a little bit. Don't worry. Th things are going to turn around. What's your, um, what do you get asked the most by guys? Like for me, I get stuff like, you know, how do I get her back? Or what do you think of no faps? You know, stuff like that. Like the typical 
lyrics, but what do you normally get from the guys out there that are looking for you for advice? Oh man. Um, yeah. Cause uh, you probably get this a lot too. It's like, Oh, my girlfriend broke up with me. How do I get her back? Um, and you know, the toxic masculinity character that I, I created, um, people look to that for inspiration. How do I get bigger? How do I get my girl back? How forget my girl? How do I get these three girls at the bar I saw this weekend back to my apartment? You know, they're always looking for that type of motivation. It's always something gym related. You know, how much protein should I be eating all the way to, you know, I like this girl. How do I get her to I lost my girlfriend? I'm sad. Uh, I want her back. Those are it's always surrounded either by fitness or relationship mm. advice. I got I got like a male dominant audience. It's like 90, 95 percent, man. I'm sure it's the same, same thing here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, like what is it that you wish guys were doing today that they're not doing right now? Cause I mean, I see a lot of like generalized weakness, you know, in men today, like the pussification of the West is a real thing. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of estrogen dominant males out there. Like you see them walking around with female breast tissue. Like there's a lot of things that are throwing society side, toxic feminism, all not all, but like the vast majority of the male population bending the knee to women and making themselves less so she can become more. What do you, what do you see that's going on out there? Like, do you see a, a general trend or anything? No, I just see a lot of dudes that have zero confidence. Um, and I really think that it's a confidence issue that people have. And one way to build your confidence is to go to the gym. I mean, yeah. when, when, when I was younger, I would think, um, you know, it's really hard, man, because like you said, the pussification of, of America and just the world in general is, is a real thing. And I, I really think that it comes down to dudes – paying too much attention to the small percent of that that's going on. I know that doesn't explain it, but I would just say get in the gym, fitness, motivate yourself and, and be more confident. And then you'll have a whole new different outlook on life. And you'll kind of take all the toxic feminism and everything. You can kind of push that aside and, and stay in your lane, so to speak. Yeah, that's how I got started. I mean, I, I, you know, I was a skinny kid. I'm, I'm, I'm just under six three, but I was like a buck sixty, sixty two or something like that when I was seventeen wow. or eighteen. I just started doing like wicked amounts of push ups and chin ups and stuff like that. And by the time I was twenty three, twenty four, I was like about two hundred five or so. And I can tell you guys, I mean, uh, like something as simple as lifting will change your life and your attitude and your confidence levels. Like, you walk out of a gym with your endocrine system firing on all cylinders, you know, your T's feeling good, you're in full balance, you're jacked and looking good. And people look at you, you know, men, men want to be like, look like you and women want to be with you sort of thing. Um, you know, it's a starting point, like at least start with something like that to get the ball rolling. Right. Um, hundred yeah, percent. What do you think of this whole, um, like red pill manosphere MGTOW movement? Like I'm wondering if you got any insight on that. I really don't. I, I mean, I've heard about, see the, the problem with me is I'm, I'm the, t I, I, are you familiar with Rich Piana? Yeah. The yeah. By the big, huge bodybuilder. Yeah. He, I would watch old videos of his and he would, and this is when I was first coming up and in, in doing videos and you would pay attention to every comment you got, you would watch, you know, all the other creators. I would say for the past couple of years, maybe two or three years, I don't watch anyone else's stuff. I don't mm -hmm. pay attention to anything that's going on in the internet unless it's brought to my attention by my manager. It's like, yo, this is a hot trend right now. This is a hot topic. Talk about this. So I've heard and I know a little bit about, you know, all the red pill stuff, but I don't, I don't watch any content on it. I don't really pay attention to it. I just kind of stay in my own zone because I never want to be influenced by what somebody else is doing. And someone call me like a copycat. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, I, I just do my, my own thing, but, um, I mean, I'm on board with all the red pill stuff, obviously. So, so, I mean, basically you've got like a management team that says, yo, Robert, you know, this is a uh, trending topic. You need to do something on this one. Yep. But yeah, that, that's how it goes. I don't want, I, on Instagram, I have everybody muted. So I don't yeah. see, I never see anybody shit ever. You don't even see feed. Nothing. Eh? Nothing. Zero. Okay, so I'm always on my feed. <laughs> do they end up outlining what they think you should talk about? Or they just say, Hey, there's uh Pokemon's trending right now. You got to do something to shit on this. Yeah. That that's pretty much how it goes. And then I'll educate myself on whatever it is. You know, I'll watch a video or two of like, all right, I, I, I got the gist of this. Let's go. And then I'll get in the car and, and do it. But yeah, I have, 
Um, there's, there's a couple of people on my management team that will text me a couple times a week. Like, Hey, this is trending on TikTok. See if you get hit this. And sometimes I don't, sometimes I'm like, nah, this really doesn't work for me. I, I don't think I, nothing creative comes to mind. Um, but I have my own personal manager, Joey bags. He, uh, he, he sends me stuff all day long the other people that are in my crew. They always send me whatever's, whatever's trending. It's just more healthy for me not to see anything because then I get consumed in, in the, um, in what everybody else is doing. I just want to focus on what I'm doing. Yeah. I've been, um, I've been really trying to adopt that mindset the last year. It's like, you know, post and ghost, like do your thing, ignore the comments, stay out of there because I mean, you get haters and you get guys that love what you do, but at the end of the day, when you get to a certain size, like you put a video out and you get 2000 comments, like there's no way you're going to respond to all of them. It's, it's impossible. Yeah. Like those days are long gone. And you know, for the most part, I don't even have time to watch my friends shit. Like I have friends that put out some cool content. Like I, I follow as few people as possible. And even then I got a lot of them muted too. Like, I just want to see the ones that kind of entertain me or might be a source of good information. Right. I get it. Um, let me ask you about your um, your personal relationship, like your wife, your girlfriend, like you've been with her for a long time and, you know, feel free to leave out whatever you feel comfortable, you know, keeping private. But um, guys always are looking for guidance in this area. And one of the things that brings a lot of dudes to my content is I talk about a lot of these concepts and I'm not a big fan of the name Manosphere and all that sort of stuff. I basically look at it like a mano swamp now because there's a lot of douches in that space, you know, putting out content that you know, tarnish your name. You don't want to associate with these clowns, but, um, like there's a lot of guys that get value out of it. Like I wrote this, um, you know, I wrote this book. I don't know if you've seen it yet or not. You've probably, you know, heard I've, about I've it. Seen, anyway. I've seen the book. I haven't read it. Though. Yeah. But, um, it, 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 it basically gets guys like unplugged from the bull crap lies that don't serve them and helps them to update their beliefs. So I wanted to ask you, you know, personally, in your own relationship, you're obviously, you know, uh, successful in it from what I can tell because you've been with her for a long time. She's in your frame. You know, she contributes to your content. Um, she, I never see her challenge you or like get getting bitchy with you or anything like that, which is always a sign, you know, the relationship. That happens off camera. It <laughs> happens <laughs> off camera. So, yeah. so, I mean, at least she's respectful to you live, you know, sort of thing when you're doing things. But what would you attribute the success to the long-term component of that relationship for you? I, I, she's been there since the very beginning. Like when we first started doing the Vine and, and the Instagram videos back in 2012 or, uh, yeah, I think it was the tail end of 2012. So she's been there since the very beginning. If I wasn't with her now and I, I would be scared to meet another girl right now because you never know what they want. They're like, oh, he's got a million followers on Instagram. I just want to date him because of that. But because Marissa, my wife, was with me from the very beginning, I think she just kind of, she grew with me. So she doesn't give me shit. Um, in my videos, I'm always talking about, uh, you know, the characters always talking about banging women and this and that. And she gets that it's a character. So she really doesn't give me crap about that, but she's been there since day one. And I think that's, that's helped me because like I said before, probably three times now she grew with the Robert Frank brand mm -hmm. and that that's helped, that's helped me out. So she's seen all the ups and the downs and she knows that it's just a shtick and, um, just enjoy the ride. Yeah, you were what I would probably define more of as a, you know, as a natural, like you just get it, like, you know, that you got to be on your grind and on your purpose. Um, a lot of guys don't understand that concept and they tend to relax and get a little lazy in their relationships. And that's when, you know, their chick's eyes start to wander elsewhere. Yeah. yeah um, you're right. I know you got stuff to do. We're coming up on the hour and I want to, you know, try to respect your time here. So I want to start to wrap up, but I mean, you got any closing yeah. thoughts for guys watching this stuff? No. Um, I mean, again, the, uh, the Robert Frank, uh, character is pretty bottled into the gym. So I would tell everybody, if you are not in, uh, doing something to improve your physique and your confidence, which in turn will, will come with both, um, do that. And, you know, rich, like you said, show people, uh, show him that you could do your 30 pushups in a row, run for a minute and do whatever you do, because that's going to help your confidence and your overall appearance. And, um, dudes are going to want to look like you and chicks are going to want to be with you. And, uh, that's a very good way to put it. Yeah. Bingo. Let me just grab these last few super chats here. I noticed in high school that when I exercised and ate good, I had so much confidence and it was an amazing experience because I was not even interested in relationships and girls threw themselves at me. It was insane felt so unreal yeah dude that's you know it's the real deal um what kind of shelf life you know before we go what kind of shelf life do you think you've got as a 
gym bro beast, you know, sort of thing. Cause I'm coming up in my late forties now. Right. And I'm starting to Same. realize like, I don't want to do like hardcore bodybuilding anymore, man. Like my back doesn't take heavy squats anymore. Um, you know, my left knee's kind of fucked up. My shoulder doesn't want to do, you know, straight bar presses. So I kind of work around that. Like I've spent most of my time now doing mostly cardio stuff, going to the dojo, le learning combat skills, boxing. I still lift, but not as much as I used to and not as heavy as I used to. What do you think the shelf life is for stuff like this, you know, for guys like us? Um, honestly, I, I, I don't ever see myself stopping, um, working out, um, you know, right now I'm just, I'm in a unique, uh, situation where I had what happened to me and now I'm trying to build back. So that's going to give me content for, you know, the next year, at least before I'm back to looking the way I did. So thinking down the line, I'm like, all right, I got another year of this where I could, you know, inspire people and motivate through my comeback story. And then I'm thinking, oh, I don't know, maybe I got another year or two left because nobody's going to want to listen to a 50 year old with a bandana screaming in the car. So I understand there's a shelf life to what I do which is why I want to expand into all the behind the scenes things that we're doing right now. Um, yeah. All right. So there you have it guys. You can go uh, find him on uh, social. looks like Instagram is the biggest uh, place where stuff's put out, but go to his website, Robert Frank, 615.com or uh, just search for Robert Frank, 615. You'll find all of his social stuff. He's a good dude. Uh, great entertainer. He has a podcast, glorious house of gains podcast. Um, yeah. Go check him out, man. I've, I've, I've been, entertained and enlightened at the same time one minute at a time when i've watched you you know do your thing so i'm looking forward to the the comeback and the return of that guy and that character um yeah check him out guys appreciate you being on brother yeah before i go i want to say I, I appreciate you and what you do in this 15 second world of attention spans where people want to watch something for 15 seconds and then scroll away um you you've done very well for yourself in holding people's attention uh for you know, I know you have longer videos and, and stuff like this, which is almost an hour long and people, you hold people's attention. You're a good host and you're a good dude. So thank you for having me. Thanks brother. I'll see you soon. Eh? Alrighty.